A continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Everyone that cometh to me and heareth my words and doth them, I I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dig deep and laid the foundation upon a rock. And when a flood came, the stream beat vehemently upon the house, and it could not shake it, for it was founded on a rock. But he that heareth and doth not is like to a man building his house upon the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So far, the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Peace be to you. And welcome to this, our mission, the climbing of the mountain of God. I remember once I was at the dentist. If you ever go to the dentist and you need a little uh, work on your teeth, they pull out this big shot. It's silver, stainless steel, and they try not to show it to you because it scares you so much. It's so big because they got to reach back into your mouth. And they usually put a little Novocaine on your gum to kind of deaden the spot where they're going to stick you. Well, I had this one dentist, and I never had this happen to me before, and I never experienced it. Well, he took my cheek, maybe you've had this, and he kind of shook it like that. And then as, I, as he was doing that, he stuck me with that needle. I didn't even know it. And I said, Doc, when are you going to stick me with that needle? I already did. Like, you're kidding. So that's kind of what I want to do to you tonight. I want to grab your cheek and I want to shake it while I give you a good shot. It's going to sting a little perhaps. I'm not going to be very good at shaking you in one area to distract you perhaps from the sting. But hopefully we'll take a little bit of the sting out tonight. On Sunday... We heard how Dante experienced a certain separation from God due to sin. And if you remember, we put a bookmark there and a couple other bookmarks this week. And this is it. We're pulling it out tonight. Now, it seemed that an anathema or a curse was upon Dante. He was separated from God. That God the Father had turned against his adopted son. Thus, Dante could not climb up the mountain directly to see the face of God. He first had to experience what sin can do, what it can do to souls. Now, we can put a name on what happened to Dante. We can use the scriptures. It is called the wrath of God, the anger of God. So here's our bookmark. The same happened to the Israelites. They were led to the mountain of God. We spoke about that and how they could have quickly entered into the promised land, but they sinned. What happened to them? Forty years in the desert. And some of them died in their sins. The earth opened up and the fiery pit swallowed them alive. Right in the scriptures. It's a proof that there is a hell And it has human occupants. Now examining the scriptures from Genesis to the apocalypse, we find that the wrath of God entails two stages. First, well, God offers man a grace. He offers man some gift of himself or he wants man to do something for him. So he's offering him something, maybe just even keeping the commandments as an example. Jesus did say, after all, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if man responds, he grows in holiness and he merits to receive yet another grace. And using our theme, man goes up the mountain step by step, receiving grace upon grace to keep climbing, ultimately to make it to the top. Ultimately, to be completely dead, completely crucified to the world, and yet filled with God's glory in the face-to-face vision of heaven when he dies. No purgatory. Now think of Moses glowing from being on the mountain. He climbed up and he received grace upon grace, and after a while he started to glow. 
He's on fire with love of God. How did this come to pass? But that he first turned aside and went up the mountain to the burning bush, which is a symbol of Our Lady, a creature. And yet she's got the fire of God in her that does not consume her. So that turning of Moses to climb and see God for the first time, that's response to God's grace. That's why the Bible said he turned. It's very interesting. Yet what happens when man does not respond? What happens when he does not respond or does not live according to the commandments? At times, God tries again and again and again because he's so good. But we can still say no. So God made man free to choose. Then what happens? This no to God leads to the second stage in the wrath of God. God simply pulls back and lets man experience where his sins and his bad choices lead him. So, you don't want to say yes? Okay. Have it your way. And he pulls away. This pulling away of the Creator from His creation is, in essence, the wrath of God. When man responds to God, he cooperates with God to build on solid rock. And when man fails to respond to God, he builds without God on sand. And we know the rest of the story. A flood came. Why do you think our Lord used the image of a flood? Hmm... Well, it is God. It is God who brings order and harmony and beauty and truth and loveliness to all of creation. And all who are willing to cooperate with Him can participate in this effort. This beauty, truth, harmony, goodness, loveliness. He created this world to be perfect at the start. We talked about that, but it fell with the sins of the angels and of men. Once again, this is why Adam is depicted as going down the mountain from Jerusalem to Jericho. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, he's going down from a perfect situation to a less perfect. The result is that we have been experiencing something of the wrath of God ever since Adam did that. We have to work hard to gain mastery over the world. We get sick. We die. This means that sin is directly connected to suffering. Now, here's one of those lines that we have to underline and we have to maybe even highlight. Moral evil leads to physical evil. People don't like to hear this. Moral evil sin leads to physical evil. Ultimately, sin, therefore, is where disorder, disharmony, division, deformity, depression, sickness, and ultimately death come from. Disasters. I want to say almost all begin with D. It's because they're diabolic. He's the devil. He loves D things. Drugs, depression, deformity, division, disharmony, disorder, death. Well, sin causes God to put away, pull away, and then things start to fall apart. He holds things together. If he starts pulling apart, things start falling apart. If he pulls away, things start falling apart. That is the wrath of God. He wants to show us where our way of thinking and acting will lead. It's kind of scary. And what is sobering is that when God pulls away, There's no such thing as a vacuum. So who do you think comes in to fill in that area? The devil. There's no such thing as a vacuum in the physical or spiritual realm. Thus, in a time of wrath, we can say that he, the devil, is given a longer reach, a longer leash. Or we could even say gulp. He could be unleashed. No leash at all. At times, he becomes a sort of policeman for God, dishing out to us what our sins deserve. 
Now keep in mind that this has some blessings associated with it. That's why God allows it, because he's going to bring good out of it. Sin makes us turn down the mountain to head to Jericho, ultimately to slide into the pit. God's wrath often acts for our good then, because it's like a stick thrown into the spokes of our wheels to slow us down or make us stop and reconsider turning away from sin and turn back up the mountain. Turn away from sin and its destructive power. Now, recognizing then the connection between sin and suffering helps stop repeated sins. Once again, moral evil leads to physical evil. You start committing some sins, bad things start happening. You're like, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't do that again. Remember what happened last time? That's why we have prisons. That's why we have punishments. Now, to see this more clearly, let us consider a few scriptural examples. Now, let's consider the Canticle of Canticles, a song of songs. It begins with the touching passage. Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. In a way, that is the theme of all creation. A kiss is something special from God. It's a grace coming from the word of God, the mouth of God, coming from our Lord. It is the voice of God speaking in our hearts. Do this for me. Later, in the same canticle, in the same book, there's a place where the lover, who is our blessed Lord, he knocks on the door. But what happens? The one he loves is in bed. He wants to give her a kiss. The one he loves, that's the soul. Yet the one he loves, the soul, hesitates to get out of bed. Why? Because to open the door, the hands of the beloved one need to be dripping with myrrh. Now in the Bible, when it says that the hands are dripping with myrrh, or there's ever any mention of myrrh, it's regarding suffering and sacrifice. In order for me to open that door, I need to have sacrifice. You just can't jump up and open the door. You have to have something to offer. So the beloved soul Hands must be dripping with myrrh, symbolizing sacrifice, the mark of true love. We've talked about this. Thus, the soul hesitates and does not respond immediately. But when she does finally respond after additional graces are being given, what happens? If you know the story, she finally opens the door, but it's too late. The beloved, the lover of souls is gone. And so she has to seek him. She goes out in the city and she tries to find him. And what happens to this soul that loves the Lord that's responding finally to the graces she's beaten she's wounded she's stripped by the keepers of the city there it is after this suffering I think she finally does find the lover but there it is God gives us graces and if we respond which usually requires a sacrifice something of ourselves we have to give up something to say yes to God we can't have it all can't have our cake and eat it too as we say this is the myrrh Moses had to take off his shoes first he had to turn and go up the mountain that took a sacrifice he had his mind set on other duties Then he went up the mountain. Then he had to take off his shoes, which symbolizes that he had to take off his uh, part of his human nature, as it were, his fallen nature. He had to give up some things. He had to be purified before he could speak to God before the burning bush. But once we do that, we respond to that grace. Then it's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. It gets easier each time, at least for a while, to keep saying yes. But if we do not, we will have to experience the consequences of choosing ourselves over God. There it is. What are the consequences? Well, let's look at a couple of New Testament examples. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? This is in the fifth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, I believe. What happened to them? They lied to the Pope, St. Peter. God was so displeased by this sin, he pulled away. He pulled away so quickly, they died instantly. That's the wrath of God. And it's in the New Testament, not just the Old. Well, how about the story of Zachary 
Saint Zachary, the father of Saint John the Baptist, he received a special grace from God through the archangel Gabriel to be the father of the forerunner. This was a very special grace. Because he hesitated to believe, he did not respond virtuously. In other words, what happened? Well, God pulled back and he went deaf and he went dumb. Couldn't hear and he couldn't speak. God gave him time to think about his behavior and he was ultimately cured. Now, how was he cured? Do you remember the story? Through the birth and the naming of his son, John the Baptist, whose job it was to turn the father to the son and the son to the father, lest the land be smitten with a curse. Hmm. Are we under some wrath of God due to our sins? I dare say the answer probably is yes. I think we all can say yes to at least a little bit. Then we too need a John the Baptist, which you have here in this mission and your missionaries. We're here to help turn the heart of the father to the children, the children of the father. Now let us turn our attention to a more universal application of the principle that we've just developed by examining something of the times of Noah and the flood. Remember, when the water came, the house fell. Jesus was referring to the flood. So let's look at it on a more universal scale, the wrath of God, because the flood of Noah is a clear example of this of the wrath of God on a more universal scale. At that time, men as a whole grew unresponsive to the grace of God due to their carnal sins. This problem was ubiquitous, fancy word for meaning that it was everywhere. Well, God, however, was very patient with them. If you know the story, it took about a 100 years for Noah to build the ark. They were warned. Yet in all that time, the people did not repent, but continued to give and to be given in marriage. And if you read St. Peter's letter, he refers to the situation. They were lustful. They were scoffers. That was their major problem. Thus, the two features of this time were excessive sensual enjoyment and utter dullness to the voice of God. Now, does that not sound familiar? Once again, the leopard is all around us, the leopard of lust. Here is the predecessor to Egypt and Jericho in our own Egypt-like times. God is once again pulling back. Thus, we have disaster upon disaster coming upon us with few people listening. Now, the various messages from heaven, such as Our Lady of La Salette, as well as Saint, Sister Mary of St. Peter, Carmelite nun, fully approved visions and and messages from heaven tell us the main reasons for these disasters that we're experiencing. Okay, so we know that moral evil leads to physical evil. We got a whole plethora of the physical evils that are happening to us. Well, what are the sins behind these evils that are causing it? If moral evil leads to physical evil, then what are the moral evils, Father? Here's what heaven tells us. The continuous and widespread violations of the first three commandments are the main reason. It's worse than the times of Noah in a way. So most notably, the blaspheming of God's holy name, the profanation of Sunday are the things that are causing this more than anything. But we're going to get into how this works out. The Lord told Sister Mary St. Peter that he would punish us by natural disasters and by the malice of revolutionary men. This is what would happen. Has this not come to pass? We've had one revolutionary man after another. Stalin, Mao, Hitler, all kinds. They're all over in every government on every continent. Revolutionary men. Malice of revolutionary men. Our Lord also showed Sister Mary of St. Peter... The sins of blasphemy and profanation of Sunday under the symbols of two pumps with which men guilty of these crimes are drawing the waters of God's wrath onto the world such that it is in danger of being submerged. Once again, it's a direct reference to the flood, to the flood of Noah. 
So what do we have in our times but the intensification of floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, earthquakes, and over two centuries of malicious revolutionary men on every continent in every government? Now for those who have ears to hear, these extreme weather patterns and natural disasters are outward manifestations of the chaos and turbulence inside of man's heart today. Living in a culture that has given itself over to the passions, right? They're in passion, they're in turmoil, and so the air around us is in turmoil. Once again, another way to look at it. As our Lord Jesus Christ passed into His passion, all of nature rebelled at His being put to death. The sun was darkened, the moon hid her face, the earth quaked. So just as our Lord went through a passion and all of nature rebelled at it, that their master and king was being put to death, so is all of nature going to rebel when the church is going through a passion. When his mystical body is passing through a passion, all of nature is going to rebel. And she is. Are we waking up? And the answer is few are. So generally speaking, unfortunately, no. Pseudoscience comes to the rescue, such as evolution and global warming, and they plain, explain it all the way. Progress, progress. No, this is the divine stick in the spokes of our materialistic, secular, atheistic wheels. It is showing us more and more where such ideas lead to more and more chaos. Now, let's return to the story of Noah. If we look to its causes, we will learn that the story really begins with the failure of the sons of Seth. Who was Seth? Seth was the replacement child for Abel. Remember, Abel was killed by Cain, and then he was replaced by Seth. He's the third son of Adam and Eve. Now, there's an ancient tradition found in the book called The Cave of Treasures that describes the generations of Seth the third son of Adam, as living on a mountain that was just below paradise with their parents, Adam and Eve. It was the closest they could get to paradise, in which they had been closed off due to Adam's sin. And there, on that mountain, there was a treasure cave, a cave of treasures, where they buried Adam and all his children that stayed on the mountain. And they kept up there on that mountain. They were close to paradise. And they buried all the successive generations of Adam on the mountaintop. So is a symbol of Calvary that those who die with Christ on the mountain close to paradise will be buried on the mountain and rise with Christ. So it's very symbolic of the future. Now, moreover, according to tradition, they found great peace and purity of heart there. For in that place they spent much time in prayer, praising and glorifying God. They were known as the sons of God and were virtuous. Think of a monastery. They're like chanting up there. You know, they could hear the angels chanting. They joined in. They were praying all the time. It was like religious life. Now, since they were so near paradise, they could even hear angels singing according to the tradition. Now, let's apply this to our mountain theme. These sons of Seth represent us on the, or all the faithful on the mountain. That is, they represent the Catholics in the church militant. Okay, so I'm trying to show you the connection here. It's very important. Now, acting prudently and thinking of heaven, Seth made all his children swear an oath to remain on the mountain. Okay, here's the oath. I will make you take an oath and to swear by the holy blood of Abel that none of you will go down from this holy mountain to the children of Cain, the murderer. For ye know well the enmity which has existed between us and Cain from the day whereon he slew Abel. End quote. That was their oath. You have to swear by the blood of Abel to remain on this mountain. Don't go down there in that valley where the children of Cain are. Now, this was repeated by each of the successive generations until Jared was ruling on the mountain. At a later time, during the life of Jared, down in the valley, the children of Cain 
They were inspired by demons, according to the tradition. And they made certain musical instruments. Hmm. And they started a sort of carnival down there. Now, it's amazing. The story describes the devils as actually getting in the instruments and helping them play certain ways that would get the human being going. And here we can think of rock and roll. Now, if you're an engineer and if you understand things about frequencies called a natural frequency, a natural frequency is a frequency that something will vibrate Naturally, if something is, is given that frequency, is, is impinging upon it. Okay? So, a human being has a natural frequency. Okay? And if I know the natural frequency, I can make an instrument, and I can play that instrument, and you will start to vibrate almost despite yourself. You see? What do you think that sounds like? You ever... Think about rock and roll. What's the main instrument of rock and roll? A bass guitar. Do you know anything about a bass guitar? It's the most boring, stupid thing in the rock and roll band. Doom, 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 doom. He has to play the stupid same notes over and 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 over again. You feel sorry for the guy. It's got to be incredibly boring. But you know what? That's the natural frequency of our bodies. And that's why when rock and roll is played, you want to start moving like a guitar string. Can't help it. Nobody dances to rock and roll in an orderly way. This music is from hell. It's made to shut us down in our minds. It's built for our bodies. It works this direction. God works this direction. He hits you here and it'll filter down. The devil hits you here to make this part listen to him. So in rock and roll music, they're going to add on all kinds of wicked lyrics. But you're not going to be able to stop them from coming in because you're tuned in. Very dangerous. This goes way back to the beginning. These devils were actually inside of these instruments. And the people were listening to it and they went crazy. They became inflamed with passion. You know, it's interesting that when you read the uh, story of Moses that we read the other night, Moses was coming down the mountain to destroy the golden calf. What was the first thing he heard? Music. And a lot of it. Such that Joshua thought there was a battle going down in the valley. He said, no, not a battle. I'm not saying all music is bad. I'm just saying it can be used to stir up man's passions. And rock and roll is specially designed to do just that. Now it happened that some of the sons of God, the children of Seth, heard this music up on the mountain and many of them came down out of curiosity and they were listening in the wrong direction and they were listening down instead of up. And out of curiosity, they were caught. Now we know the rest of the story. If you read Genesis chapter 6, they fell in with the daughters of Cain and they slew their souls by means of carnal vice. And all the women of Seth were like, we're losing our men to these women down there in the valley. we got to go do what they're doing. And so they threw off their clothes and went down with them. And so the whole mountain went down. St. Ephraim tells us, they tried to go back up, but they weren't able to do so. Now, does this sound familiar? Does this not sound familiar to what happened to Dante? He was unable to climb back up the mountain once he fell. All those sons of Seth, they couldn't make it back up. They tried, and their hands and feet burned as they tried. They couldn't make it. So St. Ephraim explains that it was the falling away of the faithful sons of Seth that ultimately led everyone to come down from the spiritual mountain of God and produce the nearly universal vice that preceded the days of the flood. And that's why I'm using this book, because St. Ephraim, doctor of the church, says this book is trustworthy. What does this mean? Here's the message. 
This is it. This message is important. This is one of those lines you want to underline. The faithful believer goes secular. The faithful believers going secular. Wedding the world is what led to the almost universal destruction of mankind. Let me repeat it. The faithful believers going secular, wedding the world, is what led to the almost universal destruction of mankind. Now this is going to sting. Let's translate this using our mountain theme. It's the Catholics. Yeah, it's us. It's the Catholics coming down from the mountain and going secular that is causing the wrath of God. Don't blame it on President Obama or anybody else. It's us going down. Through our baptism and its vows, we have made an oath with the blood of Christ that speaks more eloquently than that of Abel to remain on this mountain, no matter how attractive the noise down below may sound. And it's nearly impossible to escape it. And you know what I'm talking about. Rock and roll music is everywhere. TV, movies, Internet, booming car radios. When I go to a store, I pray so many Hail Marys just to get through the thing because I don't try to tune out that rock and roll music that I grew up with. Yes, I remember it. This oath we took, by this oath we rejected the world, the flesh and the devil, the lion, the leopard and the wolf. And in the valley is where the children of the devil will dwell. It's the synagogue of Satan, the haunt of Cain. The devil is a murderer from the beginning and he wants to murder our souls too. He wants to slay them with a sword of vice. And he's trying to get us to come down. He's always trying to get the Christian to come down. What was the last temptation that Jesus underwent in this life? Come down from that cross. What then are the signs of this more universal wrath first experienced by the, in the, the days of Noah? Okay, we're going to go through the signs and this is going to sting a little. Okay, these are the signs that... The universal wrath is upon the times of Noah. We're going to apply it to our own. Okay. First and foremost, grace is not available in abundance as it has been in previous times. God pulls back to let us see our weakness, our idols. And so all the sons of Seth went down the mountain with little to stop them. Scary. Now, is this happening today? Is grace available in abundance? That's what I'm asking. Think about it. Instead of flourishing and expanding Catholic universities, hospitals, monasteries, seminaries, parishes, foreign missions, we are steadily selling everything off to pay debts due to scandals. Closing and merging parishes due to dwindling numbers. Abandoning our hospitals due to immoral medical practices. I think it's safe to say that grace is not available in abundance today. Second, the faithful become secular. The sons of Seth went over to the worldly daughters of Cain. They were given and taken in marriage. Is this true in our day? What's going on? As we've already mentioned, Catholics are divorcing, aborting, contracepting at the same rate as everybody else. That hurts to say that. I hate saying it. Priests and religious nearly all dress like those in the world. Think of the stars that have fallen in recent months and years and are still falling. Personalities that have been displayed for years on EWTN and other places. Where are they? Many are going down the mountain to the daughters of Cain. What example do Catholics give to the world now? You know, once St. Bernadette During the time of the Prussian War, she was in her monastery, Nevers. An army official asked St. Bernadette once whether she feared the invasion of the Prussians, which seemed imminent. Her response, I only fear bad Catholics. He responded, don't you fear anything else? No, nothing. I only fear bad Catholics. Here's a little girl who understood 
the real causes of wrath. Why are those Prussians taking over Paris? Bad Catholics. Our Lord says, when salt has lost its flavor, it is good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot. Many have gone secular, and the secular world is trotting them underfoot. Conversely, what happens when Catholics, like yourselves, try to be the salt of the earth, faithful priests, homeschooling moms and dads? What happens to them? They're attacked. They're suppressed. They're ridiculed by their own. I know so many homeschooling families, their relatives are saying, what are you doing to the children? You're ruining them. And they attack their own. A priest tries to do the right thing and he's suppressed from above. He's exiled. He's mitigated. He's sidelined. So this too is yet another sad sign that we are living in a time of wrath. Divisions in the body of Christ. Divisions in families. How many of our families are totally united? I dare say none. Division between husbands and wives. Divisions between neighbors. Divisions between priests and their parishes between parishioners and each other, divisions in schools, it's everywhere. The prophet Zacharias describes such times. He said, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, I let all men go, everyone against his neighbor. Yikes. I let all men go, everyone against his neighbor. Wrath of God. That's the second one. Faith will become secular People start falling away. Divisions. Okay, third. God leaves such ones as the sons of Seth to their own designs. So they're left to their own efforts. We know from the scriptures that in the time of Noah, none of their solutions worked because they were all swept away, weren't they? Surely they tried something. They just didn't sit there and watch the water rising. They're probably like, hey, quick, let's try this. Let's try that. Let's try this. They all failed. They all got swept away. None of their solutions worked because they were all swept away. Only the solution given by God, what was it to build an ark? That's the only one that remained. So what this means is that all the solutions proposed to solve the serious spiritual problems of the time were natural ones, not supernatural. God only gave them one solution. Build this ark. So the spiritual problems require spiritual solutions. And so how does this apply to our times then? Well, we too, it seems, are trying to solve spiritual problems with natural solutions. We have capital campaigns all over the place, fundraisers to raise more money, and yet things seem to be getting worse. So all these places, they throw money at the problem. Let's get new catechetical programs going And the children seem to learn less. Some try political solutions, trying to fight to get this or that official out of office, which can be good in a certain sense. And some try social justice. Some try ecological issues. They think that's going to help. They try to solve that. Political correctness is to be used in speech and writings, lest someone be offended. Technology, medicine, education, psychology, economics, etc. are each turned to for solutions. Please note, I'm not condemning these as helping fallen man overcome some particular problem in the world. But we must first solve spiritual problems with spiritual solutions. There is a hierarchy of goods here. The spiritual solution will cover all of it. You must have the higher thing in place before you put the lower. So, Pope Pius XII exclaimed in his 1942 Christmas message, A new danger has arisen, the subordination of everything to politics and the heresy of a national state which subordinates all to human law. So everything's going to be subordinated to natural solutions. That's what he's saying. Politics. 
human laws. Okay. Natural solution. That's number three. Number four. This is a scary one. And the last one we'll talk about. The devil is given a long leash. And maybe even unleashed. In the time of Noah, according to the tradition, he made the music possible that memorized the sons of Seth and enticed them to do what they did. To sin with abandon. Today, the occult is everywhere. Wicca is one of the fastest growing religious sects in the world. Exorcists are in great demand. Harry Potter is a bestseller and endorsed even by prelates of the church and priests, as well as laity, even homeschoolers. See nothing wrong with it at times. No wonder then Sister Lucia coined the phrase diabolical disorientation to describe this time. Diabolical. The devil is given a leash or unleashed. Let's face it then. We are under the wrath of God as a people, as a country, and as a world. Sadly, many today, clergy, religious lady, have gone down into the valley to be eating and drinking and indulging the flesh, making all the headlines, embarrassing the church. If they do not feel like climbing, they inevitably climb the wrong mountain. So if they do feel like climbing, they climb the wrong one. I once read about this nun that was made some kind of a triathlete uh, record. What's a nun doing in a triathlete competition? She's climbing the wrong mountain. Some are climbing worldly mountains, politically correct mountains that do not seek the summit of Calvary. What is more, some or many still profess to be Christian and appear to be doing all the right things, like they're on EWTN. They appear to be doing the right things, but they're not really climbing the holy mountain. They're climbing the mountain of self. And this is why our Lord says, two men will be out in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. So on the outside, they look like they're doing all the right stuff. But on the inside, God sees that they're seeking the mountain of self. They're secular. And this just adds to the confusion and the disorientation of our time. Now, a name has been given to this time in history that we live. It was predicted to come from many sources for many, actually, centuries. It is known as the minor chastisement. The major chastisement will come at the end of the world with Enoch and Elias, at which time the blessed Lord will come again on the clouds and slay the Antichrist with the word of his mouth, the sword and the the light coming from his wounds. Now, this means that the minor chastisement will be the second most difficult time to live in the history of the world. If this be true. There's an age of peace that lies in between. We're in a good Friday. There's going to be an Easter Sunday. That's the age of peace. The minor chastisement, in other words, is a dress rehearsal for the major chastisement. Although the major chastisement is described in the scriptures, the minor one is hinted at, as well as being prophesied to come, as I said, by Our Lady for centuries and many other saints and prophets and seers. We're now in the midst of these times. Our Lady said they could be avoided at Fatima, but it seems clear to me that the time for that is past. She also said, however, that the evil of this time could be lessened, thank God, by means of penance and conversion. In other words, fewer people going down the mountain, turning around and going back up the mountain can put this thing, make it less. They can put an end to it. But we're already in the middle of it, but they could put an end to it. So there's three things I want to say, how to lessen it a little. Three things. Number one, we respond to the graces that God gives us. Listen to his voice. Noah did everything the Lord commanded and he made it through. 
God will give us the grace to do the good we need to do. But since we are under a shadow, it will rarely be as strong as it was for those in previous years. So don't wait for to be hit over the head by God. If he gives you a hint, do it immediately. Don't put God off. In a word then, when God is asking for something, respond. Live your baptismal vows. Study them. Meditate on them. Reject Satan and all his promises and works and words in the world and all its glamour. Reject, reject, reject. Stay on this mountain. You made an oath by the blood of Christ. So keep the commandments. Daily pray the rosary. Make your first nine Fridays or your nine first Fridays and your five first Saturdays and fulfill your duties of your state in life. These things keep you on the mountain. That's number one. Number two, to climb more easily, it is very helpful to lighten the load, both spiritually and physically. Now, spiritually, by making a good confession. Physically, by giving your golden earrings to help build the temple of the Lord. This is the myrrh dripping from the hands that opens the door. Look around and see what you have of Jericho in your lives. Make a Jericho sweep of your life and your house and your things. Sweep out all that stuff. Get rid of it. TV, music, movies, immodest clothing, makeup, whatever it is. Make voluntary sacrifices to make the climb more easy so that you'll be more ready to say yes to God. Because your hands will be dripping with myrrh. When he knocks, you'll be ready. Third, be of good heart and have courage. There are things we can do. There are arcs we can build. Arcs of reparation. Built on a blueprint that has come from above. Now to hear about this, I will turn this pulpit over to Father. And he will explain how our blessed Lord wants to turn the spicy, foaming cup of God's justice and wrath into the wine of his mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. On December 8th of 1980, at about 10.50 in the evening, Mark David Chapman shot and killed John Lennon just outside the New York City singer's apartment. We all know John Lennon and the band known as the Beatles, for they just might be the most famous musical entertainers in modern history. Religiously speaking, John Lennon was a baptized Anglican, while both Paul McCartney and George Harrison were baptized Roman Catholics. But having been brought up in homes where Christianity was not practiced, the band members would eventually seek their inspiration elsewhere. But the inspiration they sought from false religions, as well as from atheism, not only corrupted them, but also brought about a corrupting influence in their music. For those familiar with the Beatles, LSD, marijuana, and other drugs were included as they sung and got more than a little high with the help of their friends. Perhaps what is most disturbing, however, was their false and very anti-Christian messages, which no doubt influenced many members of the baby boomer generation. John Lennon, for example, wrote and performed the famous song called Imagine. Next time you might hear that song, perhaps as you go through a store, note the lyrics. Imagine there's no heaven or no hell below, above us only sky. Imagine no religion too. It's easy if you try. And with the spirit of the world in him, as opposed to the Holy Ghost, the singer adds... Imagine all the people living only for today. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Certainly there's no inspiring thoughts of heaven and eternal life and the world to come in this song. And as for George Harrison, well, he ended up becoming a Hindu and wrote a number of songs, not in honor of the Savior, Jesus Christ, but in honor of Hare Krishna, And then there was a song written by Paul McCartney, namely Eleanor Rigby, which is really a commentary on the demise 
of the Catholic Church and the rejection of the idea of salvation. Eleanor Rigby, Mr. McCartney tells us, lives in a dream world of her Catholic faith. And as for her pastor, Father McKenzie, he writes sermons that no one will hear because no one comes near. And towards the end of the song, Father McKenzie offers a funeral mass for, 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 for poor Eleanor and does her burial. Father McKenzie wiping the dirt from the grave as he walks from the grave. No one was saved. And for those who may doubt that the Beatles had a very anti-Christian and, yes, ultimately blasphemous agenda, allow me to quote from an interview given by Lennon and McCartney, a famous one in Newsweek magazine. Lennon states, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I don't need to argue about that. I'm right, and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus Christ now. Well, John Lennon is dead. He's dead now for more than 30 years, having vanished from this earth. And as for the Beatles, well, no one will even know their name a hundred years from now. When we think of the second commandment, we tend to focus in upon the sin which dares to curse, to insult, or to blaspheme the holy name of Almighty God. But there are other forms of blasphemy, including the mockery of the true religion and the rejecting of the Christian order of things which God has established in Christ, as well as attacks upon Holy Mother Church, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and all the saints. With the sin of blasphemy, God's rights have been violated. Now, whether modern man admits it or not, there are such things as divine rights, the rights of God. In our modern world, people are constantly talking about rights. We hear about the very false notion of animal rights. And yes, we continuously hear about the rights of man, human rights, and the Bill of Rights. Well, let me take just a few moments to explain the notion of rights because there seems to be a lot of error and a lot of confusion. A right is something which is based on justice. It's something that's moral. It's something that's good. A right is a just claim to something that is owed, that one is entitled to. And therefore, innocent human persons do have a right to life and a right to freedom from any unjust bondage. Starving persons do have a right to food, and sick and injured people do have a right to care. But unfortunately... People often claim a right to do that which is morally wrong. But no one has a right to do something that is wrong. I mean, there's a reason why we call it a right, because it's the right thing to do. A newspaper writer does not have a right to libel other human beings in his columns. Furthermore, there are no such things as abortion rights or the rights of same-gender couples to marry or civilly unite. One does not have the right to say whatever they want, claiming a freedom of speech when the speech is a series of lies or wrongly detracts the poor person's reputation. And no one has the right to worship a false god or to practice a false religion. Again, no one has a right to do something wrong. Error doesn't have rights. The only thing that we can grant in some of these cases is a certain toleration of the evil at times to avoid a greater evil. But it's interesting. In all this talk about rights, 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 be it the false notion of animal rights or human rights, it is interesting that hardly anyone ever mentions the rights that God has. I mean, God is an intellectual being with a free will. God is a personal God. He's got three divine persons in one God. He's the subject of rights. And yet very few seem to defend his rights, his just claims, what he is entitled to. In fact, in the modern world, it seems that the rights of men trump the very rights of Almighty God. So when prayer is forbidden in schools because of a supposed right of freedom of or freedom from religion, God's just claims to be worshipped by his creatures are violated overturned by mere human courts. The removal of nativity scenes from public squares, crosses from public lands, 
or ten monuments from government buildings are a criminal attempt to remove God's influence from the public square, when in fact the public square and every inch of the universe are his property. And when human courts and when human judges claim a right to split marriages apart, they are going directly against the rights of the Son of God, the creator of marriage, who said what God hath joined, let no man put asunder. God has a right also to have a special day of the week in his honor. And all human laws on earth must seek to promote this right by making Sundays a day of worship and rest where any unnecessary labor or commercial activity is forbidden. God also has a holy name. It is a name above every other name, and he has a right not to have his name abused with coarse or especially blasphemous language. It ought to be noted also that God has a right to have his Christ, his anointed one, his only begotten son, to be recognized and acknowledged as the ultimate Lord of all creation, that he, Christ, is rightfully ruler and king of the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them. Every village, every town, every city, every state, every country, every continent is duty-bound to accept the way that God has established the order of things in his Christ as the only way and his gospel as the foundation of any true society of men. Christ Jesus has this just claim to such an exalted position over creation because of who he is. Christ is the king. He is God become man. And that sacred flesh, that sacred humanity that he took up, that is united personally to the second person, the Trinity, has elevated that human nature to the highest possible point imaginable, to the ultimate eminence and majesty. But in addition to the rights he naturally has with his unity, with the divinity, Christ the King has also earned his place of preeminence because of his work of salvation. He has purchased every single human being at the price of his most precious blood. We are his property. We have been bought and paid for. Now, I could go on. I could go on many further examples of the rights that God has. But I want to end this conference this evening with a very important private revelation from the 19th century. That is, I want to tell you about a special message our blessed Lord gave to a nun and the information that he gave her to give to all the world. Now, before I go into this, it is always, always important to note the difference between public revelation, the public revelation of God, especially in Christ, the Word made flesh, and something that is called private revelation. Now, with the death of the last apostle, good St. John, all public revelations concerning Almighty God and the gospel message itself were considered complete. That is, since the passing of that beloved disciple, St. John, there can be no addition and no subtraction to revelation. That is why religions like Islam and that Masonically inspired religion of Mormonism must be immediately condemned as false. Any religion that purports to have additional revelation is antichrist. Private revelations, however, are not additions, not additions to apostolic teachings. Rather, revelations, private revelations, are heaven-sent messages that promote devotions to help us live the unchanging faith. Or they could also be warnings, warnings about future dangers to the church militant and to the world. In the 1840s, Carmelite nun named Sister Marie de St. Pierre saw a vision of Holy St. Veronica. St. Veronica from the Stations of the Cross, Station Number 6, wiping away the spit, the mud, and the blood from the face of our dear Lord with her veil as he walked the way to Calvary. Sister Marie de St. Pierre was then told that the sacrilegious and blasphemous acts committed in her day which was the 19th century, were adding 
to that spit and mud that St. Veronica wiped away on Good Friday. Jesus told the good nun that he sought new Veronicas in this modern world to wipe and venerate his divine face that has so few people to adore it. Now, the first message our dear Lord gave to Sister Marie de St. Pierre actually occurred on August 26th, 1843, just one day after the great feast of St. Louis IX, King of France, who was the great crusader of all against the sin of blasphemy. St. Louis IX once stated that the best way to deal with a blasphemer who cursed Almighty God was to run him through with a sword. The Savior stated that blasphemy, listen to this, blasphemy, according to our Lord, was a frightful sin that wounds his heart more grievously than all other sins. With blasphemy, our Lord says, the sinner curses me to my face, attacks me publicly, rejects the salvation I offer, and pronounces, therefore, his own judgment. Our dear Lord then added that mankind's unwillingness to respect his most holy name and to cast insults and blasphemies towards the Most High were like poison arrows striking him in the face. And this is why our dearest Lord gave Sister Marie de St. Pierre that famous golden arrow prayer, a prayer that is lovingly aimed at the Son of God and wounds him delightfully thus healing those wounds inflicted by blasphemers. Now, we are reciting that golden arrow prayer each night to, do, to open our mission conferences. It is a powerful prayer, to say the least, given to say, sister by the Lord himself. In a later revelation, Christ Jesus came to the Carmelite sister and told her something that also caused him great pain, namely profaning and abusing the Lord's day. Our Lord said, the Jews crucified me on Friday, but Christians are crucifying me again on Sundays with their violations of the third commandment. Sister Marie de St. Pierre was told by our dear Lord to receive Holy Communion every Sunday in reparation and with certain intentions of reparation. Number one, to atone for all those forbidden works being done on Sunday. Number two, to appease the divine justice, which was on the verge of striking on account of the violation of Sundays. And number three, a communion of reparation to implore the conversion of those persons who desecrate Sundays. All these public attacks upon the holy name, the Lord's Day, which he has a right to have observed, as well as public attacks against the true religion and the Holy Roman Church, they were adding up, adding up and would soon submerge the world in the wrath of God. The Son of God then spoke of his anger, the anger he felt towards those men who ignore or reject the first three commandments that have to do with man's relationship with the Almighty. What Catholics have to understand that there is another tablet to the Ten Commandments. It's not just our neighbor, four through ten. There's also a first part of the Decalogue, Commandments one through three. It's not enough to be a pro-life Catholic. We must be a pro-God Catholic, a pro-Christ the King Catholic, a pro-Holy Catholic Church as the one and only instrument of salvation Catholic. Jesus stated to Sister Marie de St. Pierre, the earth is covered with crimes. The violation of the first three commandments has irritated my heavenly Father. The holy name of God is blasphemed regularly, and the holy day of the Lord is profaned. Our Lord then concludes, The sins have risen to the throne of the Almighty and have provoked his wrath and will soon burst forth if his justice is not appeased. But our dear Lord added later, that the chastisement that he would send to punish the world would not necessarily be by natural disasters, but rather what he called the malice of revolutionary men. Revolutionary men, what are they? They are the communists. 
the ultimate revolutionary liberals. Those who seek to overthrow the Christian order and replace it with chaos. Sister Marie de St. Pierre received these revelations between 1843 and 1848. Karl Marx would publish his Communist Manifesto in 1848. Our Lord is always there to warn us. He sent his blessed mother to Fatima in 1917 before the Russian Revolution to warn people. And yes, he sent this message before the rise of Karl Marx and communism to warn the faithful. And is there any doubt in our minds that this punishment, this malice of revolutionary men has and continues to be inflicted upon us because of the public crimes against the rights of God in the Western world. Russia has spread her errors throughout the Western world. She has not been consecrated. She has not been converted. And therefore, the world continues to suffer with the malice of revolutionary men. They wish to destroy the Christian order. Public blasphemy, public mockery, and public insults put towards the good Lord and attacks upon his holy church demand public reparation. Again, our blessed Lord spoke to Sister Marie de St. Pierre, stating that he, the Son of God, is going to come to us as an ambassador. He's going to come to us as an ambassador to urge us to make reparation to honor his Father. But if this is not done, if irreverence and impiety continue, if we neglect his terms of peace which he is offering us, the Son of God, the divine ambassador, threatens to declare war upon men by grave punishments. Now, what does the term reparation mean? Because our Lord is asking for it. Reparation means to make amends for the wrongs that we've done. To repair somehow for the damage that we have caused. It means making up with greater love for the failure in love through sin. In short, to give Jesus a kiss of love upon his holy face in order to counteract the blistering kiss of the traitor Judas. If we have ever shown him ingratitude, we now turn to him with full thanksgiving. If we have ever overindulged in a life of sin, we now practice greater penance and self-denial. In short, reparation is love. Now, modern devotions today rarely, and I mean rarely, list prayers or mention acts of reparation. Catholics today constantly speak about mercy. We hear about compassion all the time. We hear about pardon coming forth from the Savior without mentioning that sacred heart that has been wounded by the sin of man's ingratitude. We see images of the laughing Christ, but rarely do we see images of Veronica's veil showing the suffering Christ. Well, let me inform you of a message given to Sister Lucia of Fatima by our Lord himself. Irreverence and blasphemy aimed towards Almighty God or the Immaculate Heart of my mother, he said to Sister Lucia, will not be pardoned by the divine mercy without reparation. In other words, those who are stuck in Jericho, the Jericho of this world, who might mock or show indifference towards God, Mary or the saints, as well as the Catholic faith, will fall into the abyss of hell unless some chosen souls make reparation for them. The divine wrath will manifest itself through a chastisement that will punish the world severely unless reparation is done. Now, in these modern times, many overly optimistic churchmen, many enthusiastic ecclesiastics always are talking about a new springtime, a new Pentecost, they tell us that the church is thriving at this moment, that we are the church of the new millennium, the church of the new advent, that things have never been better. At the same time, these individuals disagree with the views of those that they label 
prophets of doom and gloom. Many modern-day prelates suggest the church has no enemies. But what has heaven's consistent message been for two centuries without exception? What is heaven saying? What was the message our Lord gave to Sister Marie de St. Pierre? Do reparation, but there's threats of divine punishment if it's not done. What was our message of Our Lady at La Salette? Heaven sent punishments unless penance is done. What was the message of Fatima? Whole nations will be annihilated. Russia will spread her errors. Do penance, pray the rosary, and bring an end to the war. What about the message of Akita, Japan? Our Lady told Sister Agnes of Akita in the 1970s that a fire would come down from heaven to punish mankind unless penance was done. What about Leo XIII? <laughs> he saw that image of St. Michael and the devil, that the devil would be unleashed for a hundred years, causing him to write that St. Michael prayer. These seem to be the consistent messages from heaven. And all these fully approved apparitions, without exception, there are threats. Threats of a heaven-sent chastisement unless reparation is done. No age of peace, no age of mercy, until there is reparation first. And these acts of reparation will either be voluntarily done by willing penitence on earth if we get down on our knees, or... It will take the form of a heaven-sent chastisement that will bring prideful men and stiff-necked men to their knees. Sister Elena Aiello, Italian nun, received private revelations in the 1950s that have received full church approval. Recently beatified by Holy Mother Church, Blessed Elena Aiello received visitations from the Mother of God herself. Our Lady appeared to this nun with tears in her eyes. Our Blessed Mother said, People are offending God too much. Men are covering themselves with filth, and no one is going to confession anymore. If men do not do penance, Our Lady stated, the following will happen. Quote, The world will once again be afflicted with a great calamity, with bloody revolutions, with great earthquakes, with famines, with epidemics, with fearful hurricanes, with floods from rivers and seas. But if men don't return to God even after that, Our Lady threatens, a purifying fire will fall from the heavens like snowstorms on all peoples, and a great part of humanity will be destroyed. Unquote. This last statement of the Mother God regarding fire from heaven is identical to the message given to Sister Agnes of Akita in 1975. Again, heaven's message has been consistent. Namely, an age of peace will come to this earth either through voluntary acts of reparation and penance and satisfaction on the part of men who will show love or through a heaven-sent punishment. It's one or the other. In other words, there's a conditional prophecy happening here, something that might or might not happen, something that could even be lessened. We're not talking here about the major chastisement at the end of the world, which is part of absolute prophecy. It must happen, something that must happen true. This is not about the rise of the Antichrist or the second coming of our blessed Lord. Rather, we're dealing with here a present threat of a minor chastisement, which is a foreshadowing, a prefigurement of the major one to come. Furthermore, we're dealing here with a present condition of the world being under the wrath of God. We're already in it. The malice of revolutionary men has been the scourge of the earth for centuries, overturning established Christian order, putting chaos in its place. Even Holy Mother Church and her members, has been infiltrated and infected with a revolutionary spirit. How can we be freed from this miserable condition? 
How can we possibly avoid or at least lessen the punishment that is threatened? All means are available in loving acts of reparation. If only ten, if only ten God-fearing people have been found in the cities of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible tells us those cities would not have been destroyed by the hand of God. Only ten. Who will be like Abraham and bargain with God? Who will be like Moses and stand in the breach? Who will be crucified with Christ and cry out, Father, forgive them? Catholics. Which of us will make reparation for our sins and those of the whole world? The city of Nineveh was literally saved from complete annihilation, not because God changed his mind. He can't change. But rather because the inhabitants of that infamous city changed their ways. How? Through acts of reparation. After hearing and responding to the preaching of Jonah. Well, you have one greater than Jonah here this evening. The divine ambassador, Jesus Christ, is present in the holy tabernacle in his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Literally, an image, a copy of the image of his holy face near the blessed virgin statue in our sanctuary. The divine ambassador is offering us terms of peace. And if you and I here this evening are willing to embrace the call of our Lord to be adorers like St. Veronica, soothing our dear Lord's holy face by wiping it and venerating it, then perhaps we can mitigate or even bring to a close this minor chastisement. Devotion to the holy face will save this troubled world. Miracles will be worked through devotion to the holy face of the Son of God. Sinners will be converted and our own disfigurement of soul caused by our own crimes will be made beautiful once again. Turn to us, O Lord. Let us see the face of your Christ and we shall be saved. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.